اهلا وسهلا فيكم في اولى محاضرات البرنامج الفكري والمعرفي المتحف الفلسطيني محاضرتنا اليوم بيقدمها الباحث اركان روي بعنوان الاولياء والمزارات الاسلاميه في فلسطين نبدا عن المحاضره الاولياء والمزارات الفلسطينيه الاسلاميه في فلسطين هو عنوان كتاب الطبيب الانثروبولوجي الفلسطيني توفيق كنعان وهذا الكتاب انتشر في 27 لصالح مجله جمعيه فلسطين الشرقيه البحث اللي قام في أربان يحمل في طياته تفاصيل وحيثيات دقيقة وغامضة أحياناً وأحياناً أخرى مغلوطة عن الهندسة المعمارية للمساجد. في مش قادر أسمع. في صوت مش طاقة. آه. مش عارف كيف مش طاقة. تمام. متأسفين. آه. اه خلص تمام يمكن من حاله ثانيه فالبحث اللي قام فيه اربان كمان مره هو عن بيحاول يواجه الصور المغلوطه عن الهندسه المعماريه للمساجد والمزارات وعلم الانساب الصوفي وجغرافيا القرى اضرحه الاولياء والرجال الصالحين وحكايات من طقوس واساطير تنتمي الى ما اسماه كنعان بالدين الشعبي وبيبحث كيف الأطفأت التغييرات الاجتماعية والسياسية قدسية هذه الأضرحة والمزارات ومن بين هذه التأثيرات عملية قطع الحدود عبر حدود بلاد الشام خصوصا بعد النكبة علما أن هذه المباني والسمات الطبيعية لوجودها في الغالب ما تزال قائمة المشروع يركز على 25 مزار وهي المزارات هي التي ذكرها الدكتور توفيق كنعان في كتابه ولكن بمزيد من الإسهاب والتفاصيل وهو عبارة عن استكشاف للصور الفوتوغرافية والسفر للاستمرارية هذه المزارات التي قد تم إهمال قدسيتها في هذا الوقت في فلسطين في معنا تقريبا 20 ل 25 دقيقة تتحدث من خلالها وبعدين <تصفيق> أنا بدي أقدم الموضوع بالعربي شوي وبعدين أحكي بالإنجليزي إذا بينفع أول شيء أنا بدي أشكر إدارة المتحف نبيل خصوصا ومرح كمان عشان يعني لي التواصل لطيف وممتاز واستقبال كمان وصل قطعا للمنحة اللي استعملت للبحث هذا و أنا حضرت نفس المحاضرة هذه بالعربي للطلاب بجامعة بيت لحم مرتين، ومرتين ما صارش ليش؟ أول مرة كان مذاكرات ومشاكل وهيك فما كان جامعة، ثاني مرة كان أبو الأسبوع وهيك كان المؤتمر تبع إسرائيل أجو بوتين وماكرون وميركل وكل هذول وسكروا الطرق من الأرض لبيت لحم فكمان مرة ما صارش ف احنا كان عندنا نقاش شوي اذا بتصير المحاضره هذه بالانجليزي والعربي وقررنا احسن بال بالانجليزي عشان هي لغه عالميه وهيك لسه بكره بكره ما بعرف <تصفيق> بس نفس الوقت انا حزين شوي عشان بحب اللغه العربيه و بحبش كيف كل هالاشياء دائما بالانجليزي بس يعني المره الجايه ان شاء الله اوكي اهلا وسهلا سو I'm, I, I want to say, first of all, that uh, I'm, I'm not a scholar of Islam. I'm an anthropologist, and my research is on the Romani people, the, the gypsies, the Ghajar of Palestine and Jordan. And um, if you talk to Palestinians over a certain age, over 80, let's say, um, and all over Palestine, from Khalil to Haifa to Yaffa, um, in the Jalil, wh wherever, um, they will almost always have memories of of Gajar coming to their villages and their towns. And this is something that stopped in 1948. So um, today there continue to be small uh, Gajar communities in Palestine, and my research is with them. And it seems to me that to understand the history of Palestine before 1948, um, the, the Gajar are a, are a part of the story. They're a part of the folk history of Palestine. So in this sense, I'm interested in uh, uh, remains, remains of what was there before. And um, so I've been doing this particular research with the Gajar since 2016. And the last year and a half, I've been here pretty much uh, the whole time. And for most of that time, from September 2000, 
18 to 2019, I was living in a place in Jerusalem, in the old city, called the Zawiya Hindia, uh, the Indian Zawiya. And um, it's a remarkable place, and I was very lucky to live there. And the uh, Indian Zawiya exists because in the 13th century, somebody uh, from India named Baba Farid uh, came to Jerusalem. And Baba Farid is a saint in the uh, Chishtia order of Sufis. And uh, no one knows how long he was in Jerusalem exactly, but he meditated in a cave near Al-Aqsa for 40 days. And kind of a cult grew around him. And the Rifai order of Sufis uh, from North Africa, they, they founded a Zawiya, and that Zawiya still exists. It's, it's no longer controlled by the Rifai. And actually, the, the, he's, not, he's buried in Pakistan, but there's a shrine to, in the cave where he meditated. And my room was exactly, exactly above the, the shrine, above the cave. So all the baraka, all the, it was going straight up uh, yeah, to me in my sleep. And I, and I became uh, very curious about Baba Farid. At the same time, I realized that uh, my, you know, the last 20 years, I've been listening to this song. It's a very famous song uh, in Indian Pakistan, a Sufi song called Allah Muhammad Chariyar. It was Allah Muhammad Chariyar, um, Haji Khawaj Kutub Farid. Um, in Urdu, this is, Allah, Muh Allah Muhammad, Allah Muhammad, Chariyar, four friends, and he names them. So Allah Muhammad, four friends, um, Haji, Khawaj, Kutub, Farid. And the four friends are the four saints in the Chishtia order, the, 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 the four main saints, and Farid is Baba Farid. So I was listening uh, to a song about Baba Farid for 20 years without really realizing who he was, and then I was sleeping right above his shrine. So I, I, I became interested in the history of Sufism in Palestine, and I, at the same time, I kept encountering people, kept meeting people who were, um, who were from Sufi families, but they don't practice anymore. They say, oh yeah, we're, we're, we're Naqshband, we're, uh, we're Rifai. So it's uh, traces, just like the, the Gajar, the Gypsies of Palestine, Sufism is still around in some way, but not in the, um, maybe not in a direct way or in a numerous way as it was in the past. At the same time, because I'm an anthropologist, I've been obsessed with the figure of Tafi Kanan for many years. Um, very well known by Palestinian scholars and researchers. Um, Tafi Kanan was a medical doctor. He, um, as you, me, many of you probably are very familiar with him, he administered two hospitals in Jerusalem, one in uh, Shara Yafa and one in Talbia, which is now what they call the German colony. Um, and he was a prolific amateur ethnographer and folklorist who wrote many books about magic, about the fedahin, about architecture, about plants. And one of these books was uh, Muhammad and Saint and Sanctuary. That's what he called it. He wrote in English because it was the British mandate and he, I don't know, he liked to write in English. And this book was, um, it's a massive book and he, he details the, um, 348 of the shrines, of the 800 shrines that existed, around 800 in Palestine of his time. And he claims to have visited 235 of them. Many of these descriptions are kind of like lists and uh, typologies. So, you know, in Safit, there's a shrine to uh, Fulan, and, you know, whatever. In Deir Kassane, there's two shrines to Sheikh Fulan, and so forth. And, um, it's also, you know, so that's one kind of analysis, kind of these listicles. Then he has architectural analysis because he also, he wrote books about um, uh, 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 Felahin architecture, the, the, the Palestinian uh, village house. So he was very interested in the architectural features like, you know, do they have domes, do they not have domes? Um, were they mosques, were they zawis, were they just tombs, or were they just kind of piles of stones? He called these primitive cults. And um, beyond this, he also gave kind of literary descriptions and stories of the actual saints that these shrines commemorated. And very interestingly, I would say these, are, these number no more than around 30, right? So of these 235 shrines that he says he visited, he um, really only gives us real description of about 30, and they're all around Jerusalem where he lived. So I don't want to be a, consp uh, like a conspiracy theorist, but I think he might have exaggerated a little about the number of shrines he visited. Um, travel was no doubt very difficult in 1927, and uh, he was a busy man running two hospitals, so we can maybe forgive him for the exaggeration, um, if he indeed exaggerated. 
Um, so my project was, well, it was supposed to be a photo project to kind of um, visit these 30, I made it to about 25 of them, to uh, trace the steps of Taufi Kanan and go where he went almost 100 years ago um, and to see what happened to these places. And at the same time, I wanted to make, in, in the same way that Taufi Kanan's book was a document of Palestine in, in 1927 before, before um, the advent of Israel, before the Nakba, um, I, I, I'm hoping that this is also kind of a very small, I mean, not, I can't compare the work to his, but in some way kind of a document of the Palestinian rural landscape in 2019 when I did this project. Okay, so maqamat, uh, uh, first, you know, um, maqam, as you, as you know, has three meanings in, in Arabic. Uh, one, it's the musical scale, right, in, the, in, in Eastern music. Uh, the second, it's like a way station in a spiritual journey. So you go from one maqam to another, so they're like stops. And the third is the shrine. And I actually, I wonder if they're related somehow. If the, if the notes on a musical scale can somehow be stops on a journey, when the stops themselves are shrines. Anyway, something to think about. But whatever the case, um, in pre-modern Palestine, it's um, no exaggeration to say that the maqamat were the prominent feature of, of religious life, of Islam in pre-modern Palestine. Why? First of all, villages didn't have mosques usually. Very few villages had mosques. Um, Friday prayers, people went to the big mosques in the cities like Al-Aqsa or you know, in Jerusalem, that was the case. Um, so there were no mosques. Um, something like Hajj was very difficult because uh, before group tourism and airfare, most people did not perform Hajj. Um, and also, you have to keep in mind that, I mean, I, I don't know the numbers, but maybe something like over 90% of people, if not more, were illiterate. So people couldn't read the Quran. So the, 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 the maqamat were kind of like the center of spiritual life in the villages. Um, and thus, to understand what happened there is central to understanding the folk history of Palestine. Who did the shrines commemorate? There were there are about three kinds of um, three types of people we can say. One are the are there shrines to prophets. There there aren't that many, but there's some of these. There's 25 prophets in Islam that are named. There's thousands apparently, but 25 who are named as prophets. And uh, some of them have shrines. Nabi Musa, for example, Nabi Yusuf, and so forth. But these are a very small minority of shrines. Um, um, so, um, they're shrines to Sufi masters, Sufi saints. And this is what I'm you know, most interested in um, because I, I mentioned my interest in Sufism in Palestine. And um, why did these people come, and th these, these, these saints who are commemorated in these shrines are usually not from Palestine. They're from other places, from the Islamic world. Why did they come here? So it's often said that Jerusalem was never a great center of Islamic learning, and that's true. Um, there are no uh, Sufi tariqa, Sufi orders that came from Jerusalem, but almost all of them had branches in Jerusalem. So Jerusalem was a destination for Sufism. It, Jerusalem holds a very special place in the Sufi imagination, and arguably it's more important than Mecca because Sufism, of course, it's more interested in the spiritual aspect of Islam. And uh, because of Isra and, 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 and Miraj, um, Jerusalem has this kind of esoteric quality that other places don't. There's this idea that Jerusalem is the closest place to heaven on earth. And actually, there's this very wonderful Sufi saying um, that I love, um, and it goes something like, before the, the creation of, of the world, there was heaven, there was earth, and exactly under the moon was Jerusalem. So it has this, this really special place in the Sufi imagination. And so these, pe these, these people, they came from Afghanistan, from Yemen, from Egypt, from India, from Afghanistan, from, um, there was no Afghanistan, from Khorasan, and, and you know, uh, from Morocco, and so forth. And, and also this act of coming, the act of travel, the ziyara, is central in not only Sufism, but in Islam also. Um, this, this idea that you have to travel, there's this, you know, the famous saying uh, in the Quran, I believe it's a hadith, that you know, you can, if you seek knowledge, go as far as China. And it it encourages, you, encourages you to go and travel. Um, the Hajj movement, the Hijra you know, movement, and also the life of uh, Muhammad. He was um, a traveling merchant in his early life. 
so this, this idea of movement is, is, is very central, not only in Sufism, but in Islam in, in, in general. And the third kind of people commemorated in the shrines, and this is the vast majority, are local, uh, local sheikhs, local shuyuk. Okay, and these are political leaders, important men, in, and sometimes women in, in the local communities for various reasons. But I would argue that their main power came from their ability to read. So when you have just a vast majority, over 90% illiteracy, someone who can read the Quran, understand it and explain it, um, deal with documents, this is, you're kind of like, a, you're kind of like a god. You're kind of like, like an ilah. So um, the, the vast majority of the shrines are to local sheikhs. Um, almost always, the shrines are located next to Christian ruins from the Byzantine period. Not always, but um, many times. So what does this mean? That these places, the shrines were built um, after these places were already considered holy by, um, by before um, Islam came to Palestine. And always, and this is like 100% of the time, let's say 99% to be safe, there are very prominent natural features around the shrines, like very old trees or trees and strange shapes or caves or uh, springs. Um, okay, so what is the, the, for example, the most famous shrine in Palestine? The Kubit the, 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 the Dome of the Rock. And what's in the Dome of the Rock? The Rock, right? So that's the, the big example, but uh, in every, near every shrine there is something um, that is strange, compelling, weird, uh, commanding, awesome in terms of a natural feature. What did I find doing this research, this photo project that became something else? I've, um, I honestly I expected a, a lot more uh, completely abandoned shrines. And I found that actually most of them are not abandoned. A, a few of them are. But actually the use of them have changed. So instead of being shrines, they've become, for example, parks. This happened to uh, Atara here. <laughs> You've been to the shrine and it's next to Birz 8. Um, sometimes they're used as rest places for Bedouin shepherds. Um, many times they've been absorbed into cemeteries. So cemeteries have been built around them and they kind of blend into the other tombs. Um, many times mosques have been built around them and so the shrines have become in, inside the mosques. Um, something I'm very interested in now are shrines that, um, sometimes people build houses around the shrines. So the shrines have gone inside, the, in Jerusalem, there's so many in the old city. And this is something I'm very interested in now. And actually, a lot of the, the Gajar houses have shrines inside them, because the Kharta the, Nawar, the, 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 the just next to Al-Aqsa. So th this is a future research that I wanted to do about living, this concept of living with shrines. Uh, and some have been taken over by Orthodox Jews. Uh, we know about Nabi Yusuf, but also we will see one um, called um, Nabi, Rubin, Nabi Rubin. Okay, so that's the kind of the theoretical background, um, historic background, um, coming from someone who's not a scholar of Islam, so you can correct any false information I've given. Um, I will talk about now some of the places that I visited. I don't have time to go into all of them, but I wanna give a, a variety of different things. So the first one I wanna talk about, uh, you saw on the Facebook invite maybe, um, the shrine of Abdesalam in Anata. You might have seen this from Road 60. It's um, that behind the, the background there, that's, that's Anata. And this, the shrine is kind of between Anata and Hizma. And very nearby there's the, the settlement of Amon, which is, um, which is um, they kind of, I mean, it's a part of the, sh the, the, the shrine was declared um, archeological site in 1944 for biblical ruins. And the settlement was built on um, part, of the, part of the land designated as an archaeological site. Um, Tafi Kanan talks about circumcision rituals performed here for the villagers of Anatta. Uh, and and there, it's, it was quite an extravagant thing where they would put the boy who was to be circumcised in a horse and be bands playing and music and so forth. So it had a very important ris uh, ritual use. Um, and Abdul Salam, the saint, had a rivalry with, uh, with the saints from, from Hizma. And uh, the historic rivalry between Hizma and Anatta is also kind of played out by this rivalry between their 
their local, uh, local saints. Tafi Kanan mentions a, a fig tree, an ancient fig tree that, that, that's growing in a cave next to the shrine, and it's still there. Um, and uh, you see there's many caves in the area. And this particular shrine is cared after by a, a local Bedouin shepherd. And he warned me not to take pictures there because there have been known to be arrests by the Israeli soldiers in the area for taking photos because it's very close to the settlement. And there's all kinds of military activity in that area. The next one I want to talk about is the shrine of Sheikh Mubarak um, in, in, um, in Beit Iqsa. And uh, Sheikh Mubarak was a black saint. Uh, and he's the only black saint that Tafi Kanan mentions. And he mentions that it is believed that Sheikh Mubarak, the black saint, also strangled to death all other blacks who entered Beit Iqsa. So and I don't know what this means in terms of race relations in pre-modern Palestine, but it's a very interesting little detail. And this is the kind of stuff that I really love in Tafi Kanan's book, these kinds of details about the black saint who strangles all, their, all other blacks who enter the village. Um, this is understand, actually. <laughs> Uh, that was th okay. <laughs> Maybe that was Abdul Salam himself. <laughs> okay, so this is the this is the shrine. We, the I know al Tarjama goes here to man. The Kamal. Okay. Okay, Tamam? Okay, so this is the shrine. It's a very simple tomb. Why is it a simple tomb? So Canaan mentioned that the, the villagers of Beit Iqsa, in his time, tried to build um, a dome, to the, like a, a dome structure. And every time they did it, Abdus Salam would come at night, or you know, the, the, the spirit of Abdus Salam, and he would, uh, and he would uh, tear down the, 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 the dome. He didn't, he didn't want an extravagant sh shrine. So eventually they planted a tree behind it, and he liked that. He didn't uh, do anything to the tree, and he was happy with that. Um, I found out another story from, uh, from these guys who live right next to the, 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 the shrine, the elder especially. Uh, in the 1950s, this is after the Tafik Kanan period, um, in the Jordanian period, a Jordanian officer um, came to Beit Iqsa, and they wanted to expand the main road, and part of the expansion of the main road would go through the, the cemetery. And um, the villagers didn't want to do it, but you know, it was, um, they didn't have a say in the matter. So Abdus Salam came at night to the officer, scared him, and the officer packed up all his things on a donkey and, and fled to Nabi Samuel. And Nabi Samuel is just the next village over. But I think um, in, for them at that time, it like, might as well have been the end of the world. Um, the next one I want to talk about is the, the, uh, the, this, this, this tradition of the, 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 Sufi, the Sufi shrines. Um, Ibrahim al-Adham was also from the Chishtia order, like Baba Farid. And uh, it, re it, it really exemplifies his story, the tradition of Ziyarah to Palestine. Um, Ibrahim, Ibrahim al-Adham lived in the 8th century, and he was from Balkh in um, what is now uh, Afghanistan. And his story resembles that of the Buddha. He was a prince, and he left material wealth to take on the spiritual life. He renounced all worldly uh, possessions, and he became a wandering, nomadic, um, ascetic. And he went as far as Gaza, and he's buried in, in Syria, actually. And he was in Jerusalem uh, quite some time. He also participated in Byzantine military campaigns, uh, sorry, military campaigns against the Byzantines. So he was a fighting Sufi, and he was known to particularly love sleeping next to the rock, the Sakhra, the Dome of the Rock. And there's a story that Tafi Kanan mentions where he was arrested by, um, by, um, by, the, by the, the, Romans, the, the Roman soldiers in Tiberias or something, and um, because they, they thought he was like a runaway slave, he was completely disheveled, he was you know, homeless, wandering. 
And they asked him, are you a slave? And he said, and he said yes, I'm a slave. So they, so they arrested him and took him to Tiberias. And then his followers from Jerusalem went to free him. They went to Tiberias to, to bail him out. And when they bailed him out, they asked him, look, why did you say you were a slave? He said, well, I'm a slave running away from my sins. This is the story in the Tafik Canaan book. And um, he had four shrines in the Jerusalem area. These are the places where he came to sleep, rest, uh, between his travels, and three of them have been turned into mosques. So one is in Shufat, one is in Beit Hanina, Beit Hanina, the village, not the neighborhood of Jerusalem, Beit Hanina, the West Bank. And there used to be a Zawiya um, on Sultan Suleiman Street, just next to Baba Zahra in Jerusalem. And uh, it's no longer a Zawiya, but it's a, it's a mosque now. And there was a fourth shrine in Soba. Soba was, of course, one of the villages affected in the Nakbe. So maybe that would have also become a mosque had Soba survived. And this is the, what the shrine has become in Beit Hanina. They built the mosque around it. And the shrine itself is used as a storage room. So it is still used, it's not abandoned, it has a different use. This is the retired uh, Muaddin from Beit Hanina. He no longer has to do his job because the Adan now is just zapped from Ramallah directly to the sound system. So he had a lot of free time to show me around. Um, but in the background, that's Beit Hanina al-Jadid, the new Beit Hanina. And that tree in the background, the oak tree, is associated with um, Ibrahim al-Adam. He liked to sleep under the tree whenever he came to Beit Hanina in his travels in the Holy Land. Um, Tafi Kanan um, mentions there's three shrines in Bidu, okay? And for whatever reason, he mentions the one that seems to be the most forgotten in Bidu. And I visit them all, and this was a shrine of Ahmed al Hue. Hue? And he, uh, this, this particular saint was a protector of goats. Uh, so anyone who tried to steal goats would have to feel the wrath of this um, Ahmed al Hue. And uh, his shrine was known to be a heap of stones. And this is what Tafi Kanan called the primitive cult. And he, also, so he had this shrine and he also had a cave. And he liked to walk between his shrine and his cave at night. So he'd be seen walking between the two. So I was uh, looking for this, uh, for this shrine or the cave. And I, um, I, my guide in Bindu was the imam of the local mosque. And uh, it, it was the only shrine in Bidu that he did not know about. So it took quite a lot of time to find it. And eventually we were told that um, a, a children's playground has been built around the, the shrine. And uh, this, this playground was renovated by a French NGO some years ago. Uh, but we couldn't uh, find the keys. So we had to, it was a, quite a long adventure to find the keys and so forth. And when we found the shrine, we were quite amazed. And it's the most unique shrine that I've seen in Palestine. And it is this. <laughs> the shrine was at, is down in the, in the, under that hole, and they built this. So we're inside the, the playground. And actually, I'm not sure if this is the cave or the shrine, to be honest. And we went down, this is the imam. We went, the, the imam, we, we, we went down inside, and we found a lot of uh, garbage, actually. They used the, the shrine as a as a dustbin. <laughs> um, Sheikh Abu Yamin from Beit Anan was known to fly over his shrine at night with his band of musicians. Um, a local man told me that he came from Yemen. This might be because of the name um, Yemen Yamin. Uh, anyway, um, Tafi Kanan mentions this is, this is the shrine. It's in a cemetery now. Tafi Kanan mentions that he had a palm tree, um, a fig tree, and a pomegranate tree to his name. And the palm tree and the fig tree are still there. It's a fig tree in the background. And as much as I would have loved to have um, seen Sheikh Abu Yamin fly over me with his band of musicians, I was instead um, detained by the Palestinian Authority for suspicious activity. And uh, eventually it was all cleared up. I was first taken to the Beladiya, then the Muhafaza in Bidu, and then the Shurta Wataniya in Ramallah. And eventually it was, I was given the blessing to go wherever I pleased in Palestine. <laughs>
Uh, oh, so, I, <clears throat> so next one I will talk about um, this kind of this, well actually this one is very similar to the story of um, Ibrahim al-Adam, there was a, a, a Sultan Badr also came from Balkh, like, like Ibrahim al-Adam, and he also like, like uh, Ibrahim al-Adam, he left behind this geography of shrines, trees, place names, and also like Ibrahim al-Adam, he was a, a prince or some kind of nobility who abandoned um, the, the pleasures of life to take up a life of aesthetic wandering, and he was known to be a kutub, Qutub is the Sufi concept of the perfect man, the insan al-Kamil. And he um, was known to have meditated in caves around Jerusalem and eventually settled in, sorry, this is actually, sorry, this was actually the, inside the shrine of um, Abu Yamin. Okay, this is his tomb. Okay, so he was um, um, known to have meditated in caves until eventually he settled in Sharafat. Um, near the modern Israeli settlement of Jilo. And Tafi Kanan tells a story of um, there were Jews living in the area making wine and um, Sultan Bader did not like that, so he turned the, the wine to vinegar and the Jews uh, left. And he was also known to bring dead pomegranate trees to life. After living in Sharafat for some time, he's, he founded a zawiya um, near uh, Batir, and it's in 48 now, called Dera Sheikh. And it was quite an um, expansive zawiya. You see, the, the, you see at the bottom, that's the, the zawiya. And a village kind of sprung up around the zawiya um, until 1948, of course. And the, the ruins of the zawiya are still there. The village has been raised, but they left the zawiya. And what's interesting, oh, there's, a, there's a pomegranate tree, um, not mentioned by Tafi Kanan specifically, but because he was associated with pomegranate trees, known to bring them to life, um, it's interesting that there's a pomegranate tree just uh, in the courtyard of the, of the Zawiya. And um, what's interesting about this shrine, there's two uh, Qiblas, um, and the, the main Qibla does not point towards Mecca, but to where? To Jerusalem and the small Qibla points towards Mecca. There's, of course, the Mosque of the Qiblatin in, in Medina, and I, I believe there's one in, in Somalia also, but these are from very, very early Islam, before the Qibla was changed to Mecca. So it's interesting that, that quite late, I and mean, this is like Ottoman period, that this mosque had a Qibla towards Jerusalem. But unfortunately, we don't know anything about the teachings of this particular Sufi saint and why he would have done that. <clears throat> Um, Sultan Badr had a few daughters, and one of them is al Badria. And this is something I find interesting also. So these wandering ascetic uh, Sufi saints who slept in caves, were covered in thorns, um, were actually, they also had family lives. They, they, they married, they had children. And this is kind of what I mean about a social history of Sufism. So when there is research on Sufism, it's about the material structures and the history of the orders, of the tariqas. But we actually don't know much about the private lives and the social lives of these people. So uh, to me, it's incredible that these people had families while meditating in caves for years and so forth. Um, so al Badria was mentioned 29 times by Tafi Kanan in his book, far more than anybody else. And she, her shrine is in Sharafat, and actually, if you read the news, or, um, last week there were problems there, settlers um, set fire to the mosque, but the shrine is okay. And uh, Al-Badria Al is still quite central to, uh, for my, uh, my visit to Sharafat, central to the identity of, of Sharafat, um, street named after her. She had several trees to her name. She had two olive trees, a lemon trees, a lemon tree, and several oak trees. And these oak trees were as far as Al Malha, where the Israeli shopping mall is now, and Al Ram. So where Sharafat, you know, this is a road to, to Beit Lahim and Ram. So she, her geography spans quite a, quite a big expanse. And this is the thousand-year-old oak tree. Um, this house keeps building, so it's kind of closing in on one of the branches. Um, and down below, that's Al-Malha. 
Uh, Tafi Kanan tells a story of, um, for whatever reason, a, um, a, a, a local notable, a local important person from Sharifat wanted to cut off the branch of the oak tree, and nobody was willing to do it in the village. So he found a Christian man, a Christian to do it. So the Christian did it, and the next day he fell ill with rheumatism. He fell ill, he became sick the next day. This is the sitar, the, the covering of the, of the shrine itself. It's very well maintained. Um, the last one I want to um, talk, discuss, and actually I, I want to read from my project because it's also kind of a writing project. So instead of giving this, I will actually read from the, from the text. And I will conclude with this last one. Um, Reuben is the son of Yaqub, one of the prophets of Islam. The son is not recognized as a prophet in the Islamic tradition, but in the name of his shrine, Reuben bears the title of Nabi, or prophet. The Nabi Reuben shrine is built of reddish kurkar stone on a curious flat expanse among sand dunes and is near an ancient mulberry tree. I'll, I'll get to the slides in a second. Some historians date the shrine to the 15th century and posit that the shrine only became associated with Reuben much later. It may have originally commemorated a local sheikh and ritual use of the place may be even older, perhaps Canaanite. Access to the shrine by foot requires crossing a small river in which one will find, in the rainy season, a waist-deep current and smooth, tingling stones under one's feet. The river is known in Arabic as Rubin, which may be the source of the uh, homonymy of place names. By at least the Ottoman period, a village formed around the site, which was expelled in 1948. In Dafi Kanan's time, the annual Mausum, the seasonal pilgrimage, to Nabi Rubin was one of the most important of its kind in Palestine. Kanan describes a scene full of caravans, tents, camels, children, cafes, shops, Family is camping for days or weeks. The shrine stands at the crossroads of Ramle, Lidde, and, and Yaffa, three historic cities along the coastal plain uh, the, uh, that were also the seats of Palestinian modernity in the early 20th century. Canaan cites a popular ultimatum from the women of Jaffa to their husbands. Either you take me to Reuben or you divorce me. Clearly, the Mausum at Nebi Reuben was the place to be. The historian Mahmoud Yazbek calls the festival a secular event, one that went through a process of desanctification over the centuries that by Canaan's time attracted up to 50,000 visitors. The historian calls these visitors vacationers more than pilgrims. I will have to say more about this distinction later, but let me protest here that I'm not sure whether secular is the appropriate term to, to describe the festival as we should be careful to ascribe modern ideas about religion to pre-modern traditions. But it is true that the Muslim was popular not only with Muslims, but the wider spectrum of Palestinian society, including Christians and Jews, Jews that is meaning Arabic-speaking Palestinian Jews who predated the Zionist movement, and European Jews that had arrived in Palestine contemporarily with Zionism, but integrated to some extent with Palestinian society. A memoir from a newly, a newly arrived European Jew to Palestine in the 1930s describes the festival in orientalist and exoticizing tones, focusing on gypsy dancers, dervishes, storytellers, strongmen wrestling. I picture here the boy narrator of James Joyce's short story, Araby, for whom the lure of the Oriental Bazaar is singularly spellbinding. Other accounts speak of horse races, magic shows, dapka dancing, and ritual Sufi chanting the names of God. Some of the earliest film screenings in Palestine were held at this festival. Today, it is difficult to imagine such a splendid heterotopia to have been celebrated at this isolated and largely abandoned site. There is some infrastructure in the area from a nearby Israeli nuclear reactor, which announces itself by barbed wire fences, tire tracks on the sand from jeeps, some sheet metal installations, and so forth. 
Who among the spectators watching the hypnotizing pot bellies of the gypsy dancers could have known that the site of the festival would become such a post-apocalyptic backwater? The Muslim festival ended in 1946 when the demise of Palestine was already becoming imminent, and in 1948, 97% of the Palestinian population of the area was ethnically cleansed by Zionist militias. But the site remains a place of pilgrimage. Orthodox Jews have founded a new culture of pilgrimage to the shrine, but without the festivities of the long gone Muslim. Slowly, the once Muslim shrine that which had already become secular before its eventual collapse, um, whatever secular might mean in this context, is being re-sanctified as a Jewish one. The dome covering the prayer hall was destroyed, and the minaret was torn down in 1991. The new pilgrims leave Jewish prayer books on top of what is believed to be the tomb of Reuben, and crudely written Hebrew signs indicate the direction of the shrine along the dirt trail but the arabesque arcades of the prayer hall are unmistakable. At the side of the road, where the trail begins, where I parked my car, I met an Orthodox Jewish couple from the Gush Etzion settlement block in the West Bank. They were dirtied from having returned from visiting the site, meaning they had crossed the river twice. The woman was, in fact, an Indian Jew, whose parents immigrated to Palestine from Bombay. The man told me, the man who was not Indian, told me he was lost for many years, and when he returned to religion, his rabbi gave him a list of holy sites to which he should make pilgrimage. The medieval shrine of Nabi Rubin was among these holy sites. And this is the river that one has to cross to get there, I and mean, the current is quite high. These are the Hebrew signs indicating the, where it is. There was a dome um, on top of the, the, the main prayer hall. That dome was torn down, and there was a minaret, as I mentioned, in 1991. The minaret was torn down. This is the, the tomb with the Hebrew prayer books. And um, that's it. There's طيب شكرا جزيلا ارفان ويعطيك العافيه على المعلومات القيمه والصور التعريفيه اللي اخذتنا على اكثر من موقع خلال المحاضره اللي طلعنا عليها جانب من التحولات اللي لحقت كمان مش بس يعني من خلال المزارات طلعنا كيف التحولات اللي لحقت في المجتمع الفلسطيني بعد النكبه التحول من فلسطين لمحطه في رحله الاولياء الصوفيين والتحولات الاجتماعيه والاقتصاديه فيما بعد من خلال العلاقه مع هاي المزارات المحاضرة يمكن بتخلينا نفكر أكثر من تتبع المزارات هلأ شو صار فيها يمكن نفكر كمان في العلاقة علاقة الناس مع هاي المزارات هل هي علاقة يومية العلاقة اليومية إذا كانت موجودة كمان شو صار فيها أو كانت هي بس مجرد علاقة مبنية على المواسم يمكن كمان برضو كمان نطلع على دور الاستعمار كيف بت كيف بيتعامل مع هاي المزارات خصوصا اذا كانت لانبياء مثلا زي مقام النبي يوسف في نابلس اللي اللي بصير في رفض مجتمعي كمان فلسطيني لوجود هذا المقام لانه بيهدد في استيطان الاحياء كامله محيطه فيه